The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to our Launching a HIPAA Risk Management Program. My name is Carlos Leva. I am the CEO of Three Lions Publishing, the publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide. I'm also an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. Uh, we're going to conduct this webinar just like we've conducted the others. Uh, my associate, Martin Gwynn, will be fielding questions as we go along. We will take questions during the course of the webinar, and then we have some time allotted uh, at the end for formal Q&A. It's scheduled to go for an hour and a half. Obviously, stay as long as your schedule permits. So today's agenda, we're going to review the learning objectives, a little bit of background, and then discuss risk management. And risk management, it turns out, is one of the implementation specifications of the security rule, but um, it, in essence, it really swallows the rule and probably swallows the rest of the rules as well because it really requires you to uh, institute to um, develop a risk management program. So that's how we're going to refer to it. That's how we're going to treat it. And as I go through this thing, I'm going to explain to you what I mean by a risk management program. And from our perspective and our methodology, a risk management program has five basic steps. You have to assess your environment, and this is really the equivalent of a risk assessment. And um, HHS and OCR, for, for whatever uh, reason, in their infinite wisdom, decided to have a separate risk assessment specification but also included as the first step in the risk management specification. Now, there's a reason for doing that, but it, it probably could have been a little bit clearer. But anyway, that's, that's what we got. So our um, assess, step one really means perform a risk assessment, either a baseline assessment or a new one. Simplify is, is uh, intended to get at you're going to have far more threats and vulnerabilities than you have budget and resources to attack. So you're going to have to make some decisions uh, as to which risk you're going to attack. And because of budget constraints, resource constraints, it's just the nature of the world that we live in. We're going to have to simplify. Protect means implement security controls that you chose to attack those risks that you uh, wound up with after you simplified. Four is monitor the effectiveness of your program over time, because you can't manage what you uh, don't measure, and five is a reporting step or governance, and really step six is implicit, repeat, because this is a really a networking process, and that's another reason that we call it a program. So we're going to go through these steps, and then we're going to throw it over to a formal Q&A, but we are going to take some questions during the webinar. So, learning objectives. We want to provide a foundational understanding of risk management under the HIPAA security rule. But as I just mentioned, it really swallows the rule. It swallows the privacy rule and even swallows the breach notification rule for reasons that we'll discuss. We're going to introduce a methodology, a methodology that's agile, and we'll get to what that means, repeatable and verifiable, right? Using these steps, assess, simplify, protect, monitor monitor, report, repeat, repeat, assess, simplify, protect, monitor, report, repeat. There are other methodologies out there that are a lot more complex. We are purposely introducing a lightweight process that focuses on results, not on um, how thick your methodology book is. We'll talk more about that uh, as well. We want to emphasize, and one, one, of the re, one of the things, if you don't take anything else away from today's webinar, is th this risk management program is a continuous, evergreen process. It never ends. We're going to talk about the responsible parties, the security officer, the executive team. We're definitely on the hook. But to have an effective risk management program, you're going to need collaboration throughout the organization, which means you're going to have to change how the organization thinks about compliance, or what we like to say is changing the organizational DNA, and that is extremely hard to do um, in any case. It's even harder in healthcare for lots of historical reasons, 
and because the healthcare industry's hair is on fire with a lot of change right now. So net net, the objective is to provide organizational stakeholders with a sense of how your HIPAA risk management program should be launched given the new reality. And the new reality I'm referring to is the High Tech Act, the omnibus rule, and the fact that HIPAA is now no longer a paper tiger. HIPAA is laws and regulations on the book that will be um, enforced and I believe increasingly enforced uh, more than they ever have been in the past. Okay, so a little bit of background. What are we going to be? What we're going to be dealing with is was what I used to call and still do call the High Tech Act container: the privacy rule, the security rule, the breach notification rule. Now, again, we are talking about one implementation specification within the security rule, but we're going to see how that one implementation specification really touches the whole three-legged stool of the High Tech Act. We're going to continue to emphasize that this agile methodology is intended to allow you to build a good compliance story over time. And what we mean by that is just the ability to improve uh, your organization's results vis-a-vis -vis visible, demonstrable evidence of compliance. Okay, Getting better at producing visible, demonstrable evidence over time. That's what we mean by a good story. And in order to do that, you at least have to get started and do some basic things or you're going to be found in no story land, which is really willful neglect land, and that's where the stiffest penalties are. Now, this risk management uh, implementation specification and the risk assessment implementation specification are both required. You have to do them. If you haven't done them, you're going to be in willful neglect. You're going to be looking at the stiffest fines. And if you haven't done them, and God forbid you have a serious breach, it's going to cost you a lot more than just the breach. Okay, so we that's the focus here today, to introduce a lightweight methodology to get you started. But what are we trying to do? Okay, perfection is not the objective here. Okay, we're trying to reduce risk to a level that is reasonable and appropriate. And these are the weasel words that you find throughout the security rule, reasonable and appropriate. Well, what does that mean? Well, you get to decide what that means for an organization of your size, your financial resources, your level of expertise, uh, and ultimately, ultimately, HHS or a court of law is going to decide whether your version of reasonable and appropriate matches their version of reasonable and appropriate, okay? So these weasel words can be used against you, but they can also be used to your benefit, and we're going to talk about that. So we're trying to reduce risk to a level that is reasonable and appropriate for your organization, not eliminate all risk. That's futile. That's an impossibility. And just conceptually, what else are we trying to do? We are trying to Katrina-proof your practice. Right? These are basic things that you should be doing. If Katrina were to hit uh, where you live, you don't want to lose all your records, all your apps, all your servers. You want to be able to, once the dust clears and the waters recede, you want to be able to get back to work. Or if you're hosted your EHR on the cloud, you want to move maybe 500 miles and set up shop and get access to your EHR. We are trying to, from a, a, a IT perspective, not uh, not just a, a legal perspective. We're trying to Katrina proof your practice, but a lot of a lot of the um, security rule implementation specifications and standards really are, you know, uh, focused on this stuff. Really, that you should be doing anyway. This is the this is the 21st century. How you treat your information assets is a big part of your go to market strategy. It's a big part of you know. Um, managing your business in an effective way. So we're also going to talk about agile compliance, okay? And uh, most projects fail of this kind, change projects, because of people and process challenges that have very little to do with the underlying technologies. So most compliance challenges right now to compliance officers is not that the, there's not technology out there, it's that the old docs and the organization uh, don't have enough interest or will to comply. Don't allocate enough, mo uh, enough money for budgets for 
the compliance work to be done effectively. It's a cultural problem in the healthcare industry for lots and lots of different reasons. One is because the healthcare industry is the most insular industry I've ever seen in American business. Two, prior to the High Tech Act, HIPAA was, a, HIPAA was a paper tiger. Everybody in the industry knew it. You could safely ignore it because it wasn't enforced. Well, the old docs, that's what they still believe. You know, HIPAA, Smith, but we don't need to bother with that. You know, we're scientists. We don't have to deal with this privacy and security stuff. So it's a cultural problem more than it is a technology problem. Now, the security rule implementation is more aptly described as a change project. And the biggest part of that change is learning how to effectively manage risk, okay? And that is something really that you should be doing anyway. You're doing business in the 21st century flowing everywhere, 24-7. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take a different uh, approach to how you look at managing the data, managing your assets, etc. So. An iterative, agile methodology is what is required, and we're going we're gonna, to um, keep hitting that theme throughout and let you ask questions about uh, what exactly do we mean by that. So here's a quote for you, and I can't remember out of what periodical uh, I, I read this, Healthcare News or something, it was a compliance officer that said, I don't do risk assessments, I manage risk which you know, sounds like it's, it's a profound statement in a way, and yes, a risk assessment is only a, a, a portion of risk management, but the bottom line is if you're going to manage risk, you're going to be doing risk assessments, and you're going to be doing them more often than you think because in, in order to manage risk, you've got to assess it first. And so it's kind of really, you know, one of those things that sound really, really clever. And the more you look at it, it's like, no, no, you, yeah, you manage, you may manage risk, but you're doing risk assessments. Everybody is doing risk assessments. So what is agile compliance? What does that mean? Well, agile is a, a terminology that I, I've borrowed from other industries. And we're going to see why other industries adopted it and why healthcare is going to adopt it and why, in fact, Agile is going to be the way business is done in the 21st century. We're going to talk about what is driving organizations to use Agile for software development, for marketing, for lots of different kinds of processes. Why, why the adoption of Agile? And then we'll talk about Agile specifically with respect to compliance. So Agile compliance is a group of methods based on an incremental approach where compliance solutions evolve through collaboration between cross-functional teams over time. Okay, This is not a one-shot, big bang project. This is going to evolve over time. The biggest thing that you can take away is get started, because that's the only way you're going to really solve the problem, because until you get started, you're not even going to know what problem you're trying to solve. Agile promotes adaptive planning, evolutionary development and implementation, and a time box iterative approach, which means, look, it's like the 80-20 rule. There's only so many risks we can attack at one time because there's only so many hours in a the day. There's only so much compliance. We are going to have to make some decisions, classify high, medium, and low, go attack those risks, monitor, and then do it again in a year and see where we're at. So Agile really is a conceptual framework that promotes foreseen interactions throughout the implementation cycle, and it acknowledges that due to the changing operational, technical, and regulatory environment, the implementation cycle never ends. This is really the big change. It never ends. This is a program, not a one-shot deal where you buy your um, 300 templates like you did in, in, in the past and had the three-ring binder, and you know everybody thought, I'm in compliance. I got all these templates, and you know I'm good. That 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 that's gonna uh, that sort of thinking is what I'm I'm trying to um, avoid you getting into that trap. All right, you got to think about you got to think about compliance in a different way. It's not a one shot sort of deal, and because it historically was ignored because it was never enforced. 
For many organizations, large and small, these processes are weak to non-existent. Okay, so you're creating something essentially from nothing because you weren't in compliance in the past because no one ever vetted it. No one ever, no government agency ever came out and audited you, audited you, right? You hung up your posters, you put out your privacy notice, uh, privacy notices to new patients, and, and for a lot of organizations, you probably didn't do much more than that. So agile compliance is how an organization goes about changing its compliance DNA, and I can assure you that your compliance DNA is not going to change in one year. It's probably more like a one to five year project. Okay, so Martin, I'm going to stop right there and see if there's any questions. Uh, at this point in time, there are no questions. There was one about okay. uh, slides. So, Yes, I, I forgot the housekeeping. The slides, if you registered, were sent out. Uh, if you registered late, you didn't get them. But the slides were sent out this morning. Probably, I think, I don't know, what, what time, Martin, did we send them out? Like 10, 30, 11? No, around then, yes. It was, it, was, it was about that time. So you should have it. You should have the slides. Uh, in your, if you registered after that, then you're going to have to ping us uh, for the slides. Now, frankly, I don't anticipate as many questions because this is really more a philosophical discussion but it's an important philosophical discussion because unless you can change the way your organization thinks about compliance you're not going to be successful so this is nothing new Tom Peters um, and he borrowed it Tom Peters of in search of excellence and thriving on chaos and the management guru fame introduced this concept a long time ago, maybe 20 years ago, fail forward fast, which means get started and learn as you go, and that's how you solve complex problems. Why? Why do you want to fail forward fast? Now, let me back up a little bit. Because the healthcare industry is uh, comprised of scientists, right? The doctors and nurses and clinicians and uh, you know, these are people that are drawn to science where there are right and wrong answers. And if you study a problem long enough, you're going to find the right, correct answer. And so fail forward fast is totally contradictory to how the healthcare industry historically has been trained. So uh, th although this concept was hard for other industries to grasp, it's even harder in healthcare because healthcare has this scientific and rightfully so bent. But we aren't talking about science right now. We're talking about solving wicked problems. And fail forward fast is a phrase that you should uh, internalize because that's really what you're going to be doing. You're going to become successful with your compliance project by failing forward fast. Why? Because it's the only effective way of solving a wicked problem. And by wicked, we mean hard, not evil, although, you know, I'm sure there are lots in the audience that think that, uh, you know, HIPAA high tech and the omnibus rule are, are, are evil, but we're using wicked as in hard, okay? And initially, this concept of wicked problems came out of urban planning for cities. So it came out from a, a, a completely, it came from a completely different discipline. And it was barred by the software development industry, uh, and and it, and it applies more and more, uh, given the pace of innovation today, to a lot of other industries. So, what is a wicked problem? A wicked problem is one that you don't understand the problem until you started developing the solution. I guarantee you, if you don't, if you've never conducted a risk a risk assessment in any kind of rigorous, if you've never launched a risk management program, if you've never tried to really, really implement the privacy and security rule, you have no idea of the problem that you're trying to solve. And you're only going to begin to have an idea once you get started trying to solve the problem. So this whole, um, this whole you know, form a committee to name a committee to get started in a year and a half, that's, that's, that's going to be death by a thousand cuts. You just got to get started trying to solve the problem. And that's how you're going to get there the fastest. There's no stopping rule. Since, there's no, since there is no definitive problem, 
It's not an engineering problem. We're not trying to build. We're not trying to build that same bridge that we built 20 times. And you notice, uh, I'm sure most of you have noticed that the privacy rule, security rule, and the breach notification rule are descriptive, not prescriptive. They don't tell you what to do. And there's a reason for that. Government regulators are never, ever, ever going to tell you what to do because the reason they're going to avoid that because then you can come back and say, well, I did it just like you told me. And so why now you're saying I'm not in compliance. Okay? So there, the rules are descriptive and vaguely defined uh, to a certain extent by, by choice, by design. That's how they intended it to do it. So solutions to this problem are not right or wrong. They're just better than others or worse or good enough. Who's going to be the judge of that? Well, HHS, when they come audit, if you have a breach and HHS shows up, you have a major breach and you're in a class action lawsuit, that's who's going to judge whether your solution was right, wrong, or good enough or better, where it's going to fall along that continuum. I can tell you that if you haven't gotten started and you haven't done a risk assessment, you haven't tried to launch a risk management program, your story is not going to be very good. So you're probably going to be found to be in willful neglect. Now, every wicked problem is unique and novel. And the reason why every wicked problem is unique and novel is wicked problems, the, the reason that they're hard is that they have social and organizational complexity. Okay? And that is what a compliance project has. It has social and organizational complexity. If you're the compliance officer or, you know, the chief privacy officer, you, you are trying to change your organization and get them to behave in a way that they're not accustomed to behaving. The complexity isn't this technology that can scan your network. The complexity is how do you effectively deal with this social uh, change project that you have on your hands. Uh, again, this is why you have to iterate through it. You're not going to do a big bang, here we are, we're done type deal. And every solution is a one-shot operation for this iteration. You're only going to get so much money, so much budget, so much time to do it this time. Yes, you're going to have to convince the executive management team that we have to do risk assessments over a year, over you know, over the years, probably once a year. We have to monitor. We have to do all these things. Uh, but you know, every time you do a risk assessment, for example, that's a one-shot deal. I'm going to do it. I'm going to try to solve as many risks, attack as many risks as I can, and then move on. So big problems, and this is really a big problem. It's a complex problem, requires small solutions. And it's not that the end solution is going to be trivially, trivial or small. It's that the only way you're going to reach a, a workable solution at all is that if you start with small steps and small solutions, making a little bit of progress. Get started, make some progress, figure out what you're doing right, figure out what you're doing wrong, make some more progress, etc. Okay, so these kind of, it's counterintuitive, these kinds of big, complex, wicked problems actually require implementations of lot solutions. So the takeaway is, the biggest takeaway is you got to get started. You got to get started now because it's going to get it's going to take you time to launch your program. Okay, this is an old school compliance by, um, hopefully, you've been listening to me for 10 or 15 minutes. Really, this is a change, a sea change in how you think about compliance. Okay, so everything you ever learned about HIPAA is probably bad and, and you can throw it out the window. All right. The High Tech Act changed almost everything. The omnibus rule turned the rules upside down. The fact that business contractors of business associates are now um, business associates and have to comply with the privacy rule and the security rule. The fact that you covered entities and business associates have to have dual monitoring of the contract. What does that mean? The fact that what are you going to do with international business associates that are you know doing transcription work or whatever? Right? These are. This is not the way. This is not your daddy's HIPAA. All right. You got to get your mind around the game has really changed. So <clears throat> I'm going to stop after this one and see if, if Martin's got any questions for me. The soft stuff equals the hard stuff. Oh, that's another Tom Peters phrase, right? This, the soft stuff about changing the thinking and all that 
is really the difficult part of the problem. And I know everybody, I know because we sell products in this space, and everybody's looking for that easy button. Just tell me that easy button that I can push. I generate all my templates. You know what I mean? I train my staff, and then I'm done. That's the easy button. There is no easy button. There is no easy button to be found. And please, if you're going to buy our products, don't buy them thinking that there's an easy button. We provide you tools that help you, and they're agile tools, and they'll help you execute. But they're not going to completely solve the problem for you just by pressing the easy button. That's the kind of thinking that needs to change. And so, therefore, the soft stuff, and by soft, I mean the kind of communication tools, education tools, uh, philosophical uh, approaches that are going to require, uh, that are required for your organization to change the way it thinks about compliance, that's going to be your most difficult, hardest challenge. Not how do you comply? How do you comply with 164.508A? Okay, not that that's trivial, but that's not going to be the biggest part uh, of your challenge. Okay, I'm going to stop here, Martin. Any, any questions? Yes, we do, um, and there is no HIPAA light either. Uh, so the question here is: since the risk management provision appears on several rules. When you comply with one, have you complied with all, including meaningful use risk requirements? Yeah, you know, as far as the rules go, when I when I say rules, I'm 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 going to limit it to that um, triangle, the high tech act, act container. Okay, the, the rules that you really, first and foremost, right, that you're dealing with are the privacy rule the HIPAA privacy rule, the HIPAA security rule, and the high-tech breach notification rule, okay? Meaningful use is some other standards. They're not like regs. What they are is uh, certain attestations and certain requirements that you have to meet. So for stage two, objective 15 or what it is, when it's, you know, whatever it is, it's, it's, if it says you've got to conduct a risk assessment, and if you haven't conducted a risk assessment, you don't comply with this objective, and therefore you can't get paid your money, that risk assessment that they're referring to is the HIPAA security rule risk assessment. All right? And we're going to get to the exact regulatory section here in a, in a few slides. Okay? So there's no five different risk assessments. We talk about risk assessment. We're talking about the security rule risk assessment implementation specification, and I'm going to give you the regulatory section. When we're talking about risk management, risk management doesn't appear in the privacy rule, okay? But, it, but the privacy rule assumes that there's a risk management program. It just turns out that they stuffed the program into one of the implementation specifications of the security rule, okay? Don't ask me why they did it that way. It's, it's the way it is, right? We just, it, it is what it is, and this is how we're left dealing with it. So there are no, there aren't multiple risk management specifications in the rules. There's one. There's not multiple risk assessments in the rules. There's one, one implementation specification. Okay. I work for a large private practice. I lead a daily struggle to convince them it is necessary. I end up documenting that I have communicated the necessary policies and procedures, but I do not usually get 100% buy-in. I do yearly risk assessments as necessary, but I am having difficulty getting assistance support from management and physicians. Yeah, and I think you're probably in good company, right? That's, that, that's the state of where we're at now. As we continue to have bigger um, PHI breaches on a daily basis, as 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 the message is pounded home, right? When when you get million dollar plus fines, you know, ten million dollar plus fines, class action lawsuits. Sooner or later, two things are going to happen: the docs and the executives are going to start paying attention, or that 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 old generation is going to die off, and the new generation is going to understand that this is just a part of the cost of doing business in the 21st century. So, yes, it's a struggle. Uh, but here's what I would, here, here, here's, uh, I'm trying to give you a framework on how you deal with that struggle is 
implement a lightweight process, get as much as you possibly can get done with the, within the constraints and the budgets that you have, document that that's, that's why you were only able to do that, and you, know, you may even want to document that, in your opinion, uh, you could be doing more, and what you did was not reasonable and appropriate because you should have been doing X, Y, and Z. Now, obviously, you know, you're in a precarious position because the compliance officers, privacy and security officers that I know don't carry that much organizational clout vis-a-vis -vis the CFO, the, the CEO, right? So that's going to be an ongoing uh, struggle. But I think if you can show results, if you can continue to provide updates about the, the actual risk and what other organizations are going through, um, you know, then, then finally I think people's thinking will come around, and I think it's starting to, but it, it, it's, it's slow. I mean, think about it. I mean, the High Tech Act was promulgated in, in 2009, and here we are still talking about whether the healthcare industry is really going to get off the dime. Those are the only two questions. Anything else? No, that was it. Oh, wait a minute. For entities that are hybrid entities, what is rec the, a recommended approach for ensuring the covered components have a risk management program in place? You know, it's really no different. You're a hybrid organization. You have to have a Chinese wall between you know who the covered entity is and who the uh, the hybrid is you know and and then you just have to do the risk assessment and the, you know the risk management and implement the rules just like you would if you were any other covered entity right the the thing about being in a hybrid organization is because you're a hybrid organization because some staff belongs to the covered entity some staff doesn't sometimes the staff moves between the hybrid sections you got to have a Chinese wall to make sure that uh, protected health information is not going where it's not supposed to go. Okay, that's a function of you know the fact that you're a hybrid organization. You got to institute that Chinese wall. But once you've instituted that Chinese wall, there's no there's no different compliance uh, requirements for for the covered entity. As a BA. And okay, for, I want to move on. Uh, okay. Go ahead. As a BA, an IT support company, we worry about how our clients are not very concerned about HIPAA. Yeah, and you should you should be worried because because now you've signed an agreement and you're you're on the hook for. Um, Monitoring the contract, not mo not monitoring the covered entity's uh, operations, but if you're aware of the fact that uh, the covered entity is in material breach of the contract, if that's known to you, you can't really just look the other way. You're going to have to take some actions to uh, formally notify them that they need to take some corrective action. And again, here's here's the thing, right? Business associates are usually not the ones with the economic in the relationship. It's usually the covered entity, right? And so, you know, the, the, um, the, the BAs are, you know, between a rock and a hard place. But, you know, hey, you, you're now statutorily required if you're a BA to comply with the security rule, privacy rule, breach notification. You're going to be contractually required to comply. The rules say you have to monitor the contract. I, I'd say, you know what, you need to take at least some CYA action if you're aware of a material breach on the part of the covered entity. Okay, I'm going to go I'm going to I'm going to continue on here and also illustrate why it it's incredibly hard right now to get a, a, a the healthcare industry to focus on compliance because shit happens, right? I'm I'm sorry, disruption happens. The industry is going through so much disruption right now with electronic health records, with pay for performance, with ICD-10, with the Affordable Care Act, with having to come up with quality measures, with pricing transparency, with M-Health, bring your own device, I mean, you name it. The, the 
mergers and acquisitions that are likely to take place because of accountable care organizations. I mean, the industry's hair is on fire like no other industry I've ever seen undergo this much change short period of time. Telemedicine, these aren't things that are like in the future. These are things that are happening now, that are viable now. This is change that the, the underlying technologies will allow you to do these things, but how, you, how do you actually manage it from a um, healthcare business model perspective, okay? And all of these things, all of them, right, we can just go down the list, all of them have privacy and security implications to them. I mean, mobile health and BYOD, you know, is is a disaster, a mess, a, poten a, a potential, you know, disaster waiting to happen if it's not handled correctly. We do a whole webinar on BYOD and the policies and procedures you ought to have in place to handle that. So here's the thing. Big data and analytics, right? That's the that's the big buzzword now. And why why is big data important? Because in a pay for performance model, population health is where it's at. Managing the health, not the individual patient now, but of certain populations. That's how you're going to get paid. That's how you're going to get rewarded. You need big data and analytics to figure out how do we do a better job with people that have diabetes. How do we do a better job with you know the other three or four chronic diseases that take that of the healthcare costs. So to be fair to the industry, the industry is going through 150 years of change in five, right? And one of the arguments, uh, so it makes it hard. It makes it hard if you're trying to also do compliance. But one of the things that I would argue is, look, since we're going through this must change, and this must change is really disrupting everything, it really has disrupted the way we do compliance and we need to put compliance into this mix, okay? Because compliance has uh, implications or ramifications for all of this change, and maybe that's an effective way that you get, get uh, compliance on the table because the executives are already, they already have their hair on fire with this amount of change, and so they're in, they're, it's not, they're in a listening mode, I guess, okay? So finally, what is agile compliance? At the end of the day, agile is what you say it is, because every implementation of agile compliance, of iterations, of a lightweight process, is going to be different for your organization. Your organization is different than every other organization, and so it's going to be what works for you. I mean, there are certain basic components, right, that you got to start solving the problem so that you understand it, that you try to get results in two or three weeks for certain things, and not two or three or four, but at the end of the day, don't be sold on the agile religion. Okay, the, the agile is a process, is a lightweight process that helps you get results. Focus on the results and not get all caught up in, you know, agile is the latest fad. Okay, now that's sort of the philosophical stuff. We're now going to talk about the meat and potatoes here of a risk management program. Are there any more questions? Not right now. Okay, so the administrative safeguards of the security rule. And by the way, for those of you that get the PDF, you can click on these and go out to the HIPAA Survival Guide to get the full text. Okay, so 164.308.a.1.i, standard security management process. The standard requires that an organization do the following. Implement policies and procedures to prevent, detect, contain, and correct security violations. That's really at a super high level of, of abstraction, but the reason for pointing this out is it happens, this standard happens to contain the two most important implementation specifications in, in, uh, from my perspective in all the HIPAA regulations, okay? So the one we're talking about today is the one that's at 308A12B, its specification is risk management, and it's required, required uh, as opposed to addressable. And we'll get to a little bit of the difference between required and addressable. But this one is required, absolutely required. So this implementation specification requires that an organization implement security measures sufficient to reduce risk 
and vulnerabilities to a reasonable and appropriate level. So those are the weasel words, right? You're going to see those weasel words throughout the security rule, and, and you got to be able to use them to your benefit because they're there sort of to um, hang you if you didn't do the right thing. So I think you can also use them to your benefit, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about how. Okay, so this is the specification. Um, I want to talk about some of the general requirements of the security rule because I'm going to make the argument that risk management swallows the rule. In other words, once you do, if you do, if you effectively launch a risk management program, you have effectively complied with the security rule, you have effectively complied with the privacy rule, and you have effectively complied with the breach notification rule. That's not to say that those other rules don't have have specific requirement, those specific requirements should be subsumed under a risk management program. Okay? And so it really is a program, and I want to expand a little bit about in, in, in the security rule, these are the general requirements. Okay? The administrative safeguards 164.306A. Covered entities and business associates must, must do the following. Ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of EPHI. Protect against any reasonably anticipated threats. Protect against any reasonably anticipated uses or disclosures. Uh, not permitted, right? Not permitted by the privacy rule. That's essentially what it's, this is where the rules start to overlap. This is protect against any reasonably anticipated uses or disclosures of such information that are not permitted or required under subpart E of this part. Subpart E is privacy rule. Ensure compliance with this subpart by its workforce, which means train your workforce. So if you're looking for a place to start, start with training. Give them breach notification training, privacy rule training, security rule training, breach notification training. At least you can say, look, we're not ignoring the law. We started our training program. This is how we trained them. These were the test results. You know, These are the people that had to take the class again. Here's our database of results. Start training your people. That is one obvious place to start. Within the Gen E is something called the flexibility approach. Okay, so covered entities and BAs may use any security, and, and they're torturing the English language here with, with how they phrase this, but this is coming right from the rules. So CEs and BAs may use any security that allow the CE or BA to reasonably and appropriate implement the standards and implementation specifications as specified in this subpart. So what that's saying is OCR and HHS is not specifying any particular technology. It's not specifying any particular methodology. Just get it done, right? We're not telling you how. We're not telling you how. We're telling you what. You got to do all these things. You figure out how to get it done. But in deciding which security to use, a covered entity or business associate must take into account the following factors. And these are called uh, often called the flexibility factors, the size, complexity, and capabilities of the CE or BA. So an ambulatory practice with a couple of docs and a couple of nurses and you know a staff, total staff of 10 people are not going to be, are not going to have the same sort of security rule or risk management program that a hospital, that a big hospital does, Tampa General, for example, okay? Uh, two. The CEs are the VA's technical infrastructure, hardware, and software security capabilities, right? What, what, um, what you have invested, the expertise that you have, et cetera, the cost of security measures, and the probability and criticality of potential risk to EPH, EPHI. So all of that sounds like motherhood and apple pie, and it's letting the little guy off the hook a little bit. The reality is it's not letting the little guy off the hook for reasons that we'll discuss. Uh, and this is a backdrop to your risk management program, right? So I want to just get some like basics so that you understand. Every organization could be doing more. Every organization, no, no matter you know uh, Kaiser Permanente, you you name it, could be doing more than what they're doing from a compliance perspective. But you know, there's only so many hours in the day. There's only so many resources. Only so much budget. It's constrained by all these things. What do you have to comply with? This is 306, still the general rule, 306C. Well, I mean, essentially, you must comply with all of it, all of it, you know. 
the administrative safeguards, the physical safeguards, the technical safeguards, the organizational requirements. There is no, like Martin said, there is no HIPAA light for a small organization. I mean, we'll talk about what the flexibility principle mean, means, and we'll talk about what an addressable, the kind of leeway that an addressable specific, uh, specification gives you, but essentially, you have to comply with the entire thing. So again, there is no easy button. Don't go looking for the easy button because you're going to be disappointed. You're not going to find an easy button. You're going to have to invest some elbow grease here to get the job done. There are no products, including ours, that are going to voila solve the entire problem for you because as we, as, as we talked, it's an organizational social problem as much as it is anything else. So implementation specifications, here we go. They're either required or addressable. If they're required, you have to do it. You have to implement. You have, there's no there's no choice, right? A risk management program is required. A risk assessment is required. So, for anywhere in 308, 310, 312, in these sections where there's standards and implementation is required, then you're going to have to implement it. End of story. Okay. The confusion comes when some of the implementation specifications are labeled as addressable. And this is a big myth. And this is one of the things I'd like to clarify for you. Okay? If it's addressable, it says this is right out, this is right out of the rule. So you can go verify this. You know, click out to the HIPAA Survival Guide 306D. If for any one of these, the administrative, physical, technical safeguards, the organizational requirements, if, if, if it has an addressable implementation specification, the CE or BEA must assess whether each implementation specification is reasonable and appropriate. Assess. You just can't say, we're going to ignore it. Oh, it's addressable? We're going to ignore it. We're going to skip it. We're not even going to look at it. No, you can't do that. You have to at least assess it, right? Reasonable and appropriate safeguard in your environment. When analyzed with reference to the likely contribution to protecting electronic protected health information, and implicit in this is to levels that are reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size. Okay, as ap as applicable to a covered entity or a BA, implement. This is for remember. This is for an addressable specification. So as applicable, implement the implementation specification as is, if it's reasonable and appropriate, or B, if implementing the implementation specification is not reasonable and appropriate, document why it would not be reasonable and appropriate to implement that specification and implement an equivalent alternative measure if reasonable and appropriate. Okay? This is an entirely, you know, recursive, mind bending sort of approach here. But the bottom line is what is the translation? The translation is this. You better have a damn good reason for not implementing something. If you choose to ignore an addressable specification and not implement an alternative, you better have a damn good reason that you've documented something that's compelling why you didn't implement uh, a, a particular specification. Now, there are, there are reasons. Like, for example, if an attorney and a CPA can be a business associate, but most attorneys and CPAs don't host PHI in their offices. When they have to look at PHI, they go to the client office, and they're looking at PHI on the client site, and they're relying on the client security rule implementation for the for the most part. Now, can they ignore the entirety of the security rule? No, they can't ignore it because they're a business associate, and there is no HIPAA light, so there's a quandary there. But you probably could go through the list and say, look, I, I'm an attorney or a CPA or whatever, and I don't have PHI. And so, you know, this implementation specification that you're talking about here, having a disaster recovery plan or whatever, doesn't apply to me, right, because I don't, I don't, I don't host the data. So there are compelling reasons, but a good one, and be, be able to support it. That, that is the bottom line of this. And if you want to look at these rules, go out and read them. It doesn't say you can ignore it. It says, hey, if you don't want to implement this one, implement an alternative. And if you don't, and if you don't want to implement an alternative, you better document why you didn't implement anything at all. Let me stop there and, and ask if there's any questions. 
Not at this time, Carlos. God, I must be scaring you guys. Okay, the last part of it, uh, this is the general rule, the security rule, all right, maintenance. This is the part, and there, and, and there are other parts, too, that we must, or VA must review and modify the security implemented under this subpart as needed to continue provision of reasonable and appropriate protection. So if you're not monitoring what you've implemented, how on earth are you going to be able to meet this maintenance requirement, okay? And that's why I'm telling you that the risk management implementation specification between the lines what it's really calling for is a risk management program okay it swallows the rule okay and we're going to talk about a little bit more why the risk management specification swallows the security rule okay and again just to remind you do that all done in one day to avoid the, 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 the stiffer fines, which are going to be, if you're found to be in willful neglect, you just have to be able to make a good faith argument that you're attempting to comply with the new regulations. If you can make that good faith argument, it's not to say that you won't get fined. It's not to say that you won't get slapped on the wrist. It's, but it is to say that you're not likely to be found in willful neglect, right? And that's what you got to get better at is providing that good, compliance story that you're getting better and better at producing visible demonstrable evidence of compliance and really full compliance that's an aspirational goal I I venture to say that there's probably not an organization out client that an auditor can't walk in and find something they're not quite doing right and what how do you provide visible demonstrable evidence well you got to have policies but policies are just a bunch of flowery language if you don't have the processes that underpin it and finally, you have to be able to track process results. So here's an example. I have a training policy. I'm an auditor. I ask you about your training policy. You pull out the document. You show me that you know you, you conduct this video-based training, and then they take a test. And okay, uh, here's the policy. Well, then talk to me about your processes, though. I mean, what, what if somebody doesn't pass? Is it is it classroom video training? Is it online training? Uh, you know, and, and so you got to be able to speak to that. And then finally, the auditor is going to say, "Well, show me the results. Show me when the last time you." Tra you you trained you know Dr. John, right? And or you know uh, this particular nurse or this particular billing person. Show me. And if you can't do all three, then you don't have visible demonstrable evidence of compliance, and you're certainly not going to be on your way to establishing a culture of compliance, which is the buzzword that HHS has been kicking around for a couple of years now. So, all right, that's sort of the prelude to. This is sort of the meat and potatoes, a risk management methodology. Step one is assess. Now, we did a, uh, I think it was last month's webinar. I kind of lose track now, Martin, where we did the entire webinar, risk assessment. I believe it was. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, all this is part of our security rule checklist on, on, uh, on the HIPAA survival guide store. But this is, this is risk assessment light. I'm going to just cover it at the high level. Okay, step one, because assess is the first part of the risk methodology, the risk management methodology that we talked about. So, right, risk management methodology, step one, assess. Assess has its own steps. What are you doing in assessment? In the risk assessment, you, you gather data in order to document your as-is operational environment pertaining to operations, assets, and individuals. Operation flows, you know, clinical workflows. Financial workflows, assets are your, your servers, your phones, your devices, your fax machines, your copiers, every asset that, that, that uh, has something to do with EPHI, and the individuals within your organization that touch e e EPHI. So you, have to conduct, you essentially have to conduct an inventory. That's how you get your mind around what the asset is environment is. You don't really need an HIT consultant to help you inventory. You just need to set about creating an inventory of what you have. Step two is to gather threats and vulnerabilities that pertain to your operational environment. I got to tell you here, you're probably going to need an HIT consultant that can run some um, scanning and penetration software on your network because a lot of uh, threats and vulnerabilities are going to be uh, uh, OS versions that are not patched or not up to the latest version, 
other uh, you know SQL Server that uh, hasn't been patched, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, I got to tell you though that that's not the end all. Technical vulnerabilities is just a subset. There are a lot of other vulnerabilities that you're going to deal with that have nothing to do with a, a technical vulnerability, right? Not having the right training is a vulnerability. Not having you know the right workforce in place uh, is a vulnerability. There are lots of things, and the rules sort of guide you. But this is one area where you can have an HIT consultant come in and say, hey, I did a scan. This is what I found. This is how we can fix it. And you, and you can say, okay, we're going to do 80% of this because that's all we have. Plus, we're going to do this other 10% uh, that has nothing to do with um, um, technical threats and vulnerabilities. So in step three, you assess your current security controls to um, so you can minimize or eliminate risk to EPHI based on what you have in place. So assuming that this is your first risk assessment, and even if it was, you have certain um, security controls already in place. You probably have to log in uh, to provide user ID and password to all the applications. You know, you're, you're, uh, you may have to log in to get access to the network, to your intranet, et cetera, et cetera. There are things that you have in place. You may, may, you may have uh, McAfee or Symantec, uh, you know, uh, uh, running scans on each PC. You want to document what you have in place so that you can figure out, okay, that's the baseline. In order to deal with these other risks that we've identified, what other security controls do we need in place? Once you determine the baseline, then you're going to determine the likelihood that a specific threat will exploit a particular vulnerability. You're really dealing with threat vulnerability pairs. Okay, and this is where you don't know the problem until you start solving it. They could be in the hundreds or thousands that you identify, and you know you're you're either going to throw up your hands and say there's no possible way on God's earth I can do this, or you're going to adopt an iterative approach and say you know what we're going to attack these for right now, and you know the rest. That's what's reasonable and appropriate for an organization of our size. That's where the weasel words actually help you, okay? And then it'll be up to HHS to make an argument that what you did wasn't reasonable and appropriate. And I got to tell you, if you're attacking thousands of risks and you can just make some progress, you're going to be able to have a, make a good faith argument. If you throw up your hands and just walk away, you won't. All right, step five, this is still risk assessment. Calculate the impact that the exploitation will have on, on your operational environment. If you lose power, what's it going to do? We're talking about the magnitude of harm, right? So if you lose power and you don't have redundant power supply, everything's going down, right? If you if you lose internet connectivity today, lots of your apps are going down, right? If you have a bug in a particular app, uh, you know, uh, because it was compromised and now you brought it down, well then that's that's a lesser harm. So this is what is the business harm that will occur if this threat exploits this particular vulnerability? And then you determine the level of risk. Now, in a risk assessment, you're actually not implementing security controls. You're just identifying the ones, the delta. You took your baseline. You're identifying what other security controls you're going to put in place to attack the risk that you decided you were going to attack during this point in time. And finally, you document the new modified security controls that will help mitigate risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. And, and clearly, you want to document, because this is the CYA step and this is if you do it correctly this is how you can make an argument that what you did was reasonable and appropriate given the budget that you had given you know um, whatever given the lack of attention from the uh, the executive team you know you gave it your best shot this is what you were able to do now again this only this step only includes the identification of the security control right the rest of it the actual doing comes in the risk management implementation specification which we're going to get to next. So that was the assess step, essentially a risk assessment. <clears throat> Any questions here? Yes. Could you remind us of the definition of a security object? Yes. So a security object is sort of a, a um, term that I've coined to um, get at what security controls are applied to, okay, so they're going to be um, uh, an individual, okay, is going to be a, a security object, 
an asset like a, a phone, a PC, a laptop, a server, a network, that's going to be a security object because you can apply controls to it. And uh, in a more abstract way, your workflows, your operational workflows are going to be security objects that you also apply controls to. Okay, so those are the three sort of uh, um, categories of security objects. And security controls are applied to those objects. That's all we have for the moment. Okay, simplify. So here's what you do is you take the risk in the simplify step. You take the risk identified in your most recent risk assessment, and you reduce the number of risks to be attacked during this iteration to a level that is reasonable and appropriate. Again, you're working within certain constraints. So you know, you're not going to be able to solve every potential risk that you may have identified. You're going to have to make some tough choices. And what I suggest is make the choices, put in the patches, document, and move on. Okay? You're going to have an opportunity to do this again every year probably, at least once a year. And if you have breaches, uh, which most of you will sooner or later have a major breach, you're definitely going to do a risk assessment after, after a breach. So you're going to have to make those decisions knowing that you haven't completely solved the problem. But in order to solve anything, you're going to have to simplify and be able to take some action. Step two of simplify is review the baseline as is that we did in the assess step. Right? What, can, what security controls do you have in place? Now, if this is your tenth, you know, your baseline is going to be pretty good. Right? You're just looking at the delta. And identify the delta list of security controls required to attack the risks that you identified in step one. Okay? And step one being the assessment step. Step three of Simplify is review the risks and selected security controls to determine whether there are additional risks that can be attacked during this iteration. In other words, you know, take a step back and say, look, is there anything else that we could include given our budget and our resources? Are there any other risks that we could attack um, during this iteration? If there are, then you add them. If you find that you, you, you can't attack anymore because of the constraints, and then you document that. And finally, step four, document your rationale for selecting the delta security controls required to reduce risk to a level that is reasonable and appropriate, right? This is the CYA. Document what you did. Hey, we did it. We looked at it. We identified these risks. We decided to attack these that were high and medium. We decided not to do these because of X, Y, Z constraints. Put that in the document. Put that in your compliance uh, repository, and that's the that's the simplify step. Okay, so it's an important step because really you will be overwhelmed if you try to eat this elephant. At one time, you're never, never going to be able to do that, right? So, step three is then you actually protect, you actually implement the security controls. Any questions here? Not at this point. Okay, so step one. So, each one of these, um, you know, steps of the methodology has other sub steps, you know, within it. Step one is Identify, implement, and document how you implement it, okay? Document, this isn't documenting the security control proposal. This is actually documenting how you implemented the security control uh, in, in two uh, different ways. One is organization-wide controls. These are obvious, obvious ones that you should attack first because they apply across the organization. They apply across all your security objects, disaster recovery, incident response. I mean, if you don't have a way of tracking security incidents, then there's no way you're going to not be found in willful neglect. And by track security incidents, who do they call? If somebody, if somebody discovers a security incident and they can't say who they should call, and do this experiment. Next time you go see your doctor, ask them. Ask the nurse, ask the doctor whether they're in their private practice or they're you know, part of a larger organization where they share resources. Ask them who their security officer is. Ask them who their privacy officer is. And I, I can almost guarantee you that to a person, you're going to see that deer in the headlights. They don't know, right? 
they don't know who those people are. Well, you got to if you have an incident response plan, you better make the organization aware of who they should report incidents to. Otherwise, it's pretty useless, right? And that goes into training and awareness, intrusion detection. These are sort of global controls that you definitely need to be attacking because it solves quite a lot of the risk problems. Does it solve all of them? No. But if you don't have these in place, you're just asking to be found and willful neglect. Step two is identify, implement, and document the implementation of security object specific controls. Okay, so to your networks, your databases, your application. Here, some of these are technical things that the scanning, the, the HIT consultant that you're working with, or if you bought your own scanning network, uh, scanning technology or intrusion technology, I, I really think that most people don't have the expertise. Expertise, a better C consultant, but what specific security security object specific controls are you going to implement? Okay, that's step two, and that's pretty much it, right? You you got organization wide, and you got object wide uh, or object specific controls. Step four of the methodology is to monitor. Okay, and again, if you're not monitoring, then you can't manage what you don't measure, and you don't really have an ongoing evergreen process. So step one in the monitor is develop, deploy, and maintain a continuous monitoring methodology and the corresponding technologies and resources, i.e. a system across your organization. You're going to have a monitoring system. Well, what's that mean? Well, you're, you're going to have alerts that get reported. Okay, That's how you monitor. And if you have alerts, then you're going to have people that keep track of those alerts. Right? Those are the people that have been designated um, you know, with the responsibility of tracking when things go wrong, tracking when it, uh, intrusions are attempted intrusions are detected, tracking, uh, etc. Right? When, when uh, a new virus uh, gets put out. Right? Th these are all parts of a tracking uh, and monitoring methodology, really a system that you have to put in place. If I'm the auditor, I'm going to ask you, Talk to me about your monitoring system. If you can't talk to me about it, I'm just going to assume, rightfully so, that you don't have one. Step two in monitor is ensure that identified work workforce members have been adequately trained to monitor. Right. So you're going to identify some workforce members. These are workforce members that are going to get some specific uh, kind of training, not just your general training, because these are specific. Uh, these are specific skills that they have to have in order to be able to perform the monitoring function, right? Or you could have a, you could outsource the, this part of it to a qualified business associate who's probably going to put some tools on your network that generate alerts, and then they're the ones that are responsible for monitoring. But it, 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 the, the rules don't tell you how to do it, right? They just tell you what you need to do. There are companies now that are starting to get into this business. Well, they were they will offer this monitoring service as a service. They do it monthly, they report out, etc. Step three, ensure that alerts are in place that provide real-time indicators that your monitoring system is working 24-7, 365. You know, without the alerts, you're just, you know, whistling in the wind. You have the foggiest idea um, what's well, not. And even with alerts, you're not likely to have every alert that you'd like to have. But once you find certain things that should have been alerted but weren't, you keep adding to it. So your alert system should be getting better over time. Okay? And the bottom line here is you can't manage what you don't measure, right? So if I'm the auditor, I'm going to ask you about your monitoring system. If you can't tell me what you got, you know, that's willful neglect. That's a big thing. You can't you just can't manage what you're not measuring. Step five is report. We got to get the visi the compliance visibility um, to up in front of the rest of the organization, especially the executive team. So, in the reporting part of the risk management methodology, is establish a governance structure wherein at least one member of the executive team is represented. Okay, whether it's a small practice or a large practice, you're going to want to exist. You're going to want to insist on some executive representation. At the end of the day, the executives are going to be on the hook. 
okay? I mean, the privacy officer and the security officer may be on the hook. Other key professionals may be on the hook. But there's no way the executive team is going to get off of the hook. They're on the hook. So they should be represented. They should be um, listening to progress that's made, incidents that, that have occurred, you know, uh, ways that the incidents were attacked and tracked, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So this is usually going to take the form of governance committee that includes the security officer or the privacy officer. And then what should you do? Well, you should produce summary reports to be reviewed quarterly by the governance committee. What kind of reports? Reports related to incidents, responses, effectiveness of security controls, lack of effectiveness. I mean, there will be all kinds of stuff that you can report on. And then finally, step three, on a periodic basis, I would recommend at a minimum once per annum, once a year, have a third expert review your risk mitigation and management program. If you've outsourced it to a business associate, have another consultant verify that the business associate is doing what the business associate should be doing. Why do you want to do this? Because it's gotten to be such a complex field that it, the people that consult in this space are the ones that, you know, that track it uh, at a level that other people can't track it at that level because you have other things to do as part of your job. So if you can bring outside experts in at least once a year to help you verify that you are in fact on the right track, that is an important step to building a good faith argument that you are attempting to do the right thing even if you're not 100 percent in compliance and I'm gonna, I'm gonna assure you that most organizations even 10 years from now are not going to be 100 percent in compliance because the regs will change, the technologies will change, the pace of innovation is driving all kinds of change, and so your compliance initiative is going to continue to evolve. And step six is just, hey, repeat this. This is an ongoing process. It's a program. It's a definition of a program. Now, I have looked at the NIST documents. I've used them for reference, but what here is my best thinking as, as to a lightweight process that you can implement, okay? It, it may look simple, but it's really not, right? The devil is in the details. Once you get started, you're going to realize it's not nearly as simple as it might look, but it's also not something so heavyweight and so pedantic and, and, and academic as uh, the NIST documents, and the NIST documents don't are, again, descriptive. They're not prescriptive. They don't tell you what to do. They, they say, when you get to this step, ask these 30 questions. Well, okay, yeah, that really helps me because I'm trying to figure out what I ought to do, not which questions I ought to ask. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take uh, um, another pause here, Martin. We only have one question, and that is, do you offer this monitoring service? If no, do you have recommendations? No, I don't. I don't do it. I mean, I practice law, right, in this space. But I, I'm aware of uh, companies uh, that are doing this sort of thing. Uh, and if you shoot me an email, I can put you in touch with some people uh, that are doing this today. That's all. All we have okay. as far as questions go. Okay. So here's the methodology again for the risk management program. Assess, simplify, protect, monitor, report. Assess, simplify, protect, monitor, report. Okay? Do something. Just get started and you, you will, um, over time, solve the problem. Okay, who are the responsible parties? We talked about this. You, if you're the privacy officer, if you're the security officer, clearly you are a responsible party. Uh, or you, as a professional, are going to be partly responsible. Now, look, in the past, everybody uh, sort of approached like, oh, my clinicians, they don't need to know all this detail, you know, and so the way they got trained was what I like to call happy talk HIPAA training, right? Unfortunately, when you did happy talk HIPAA training was when it was unenforced, and so it didn't matter that you did happy talk HIPAA training. But now, if you continue to do happy talk HIPAA training for your nurses, your, your doctors, your, your therapists, 
they're never going to understand the real risk and what really confronts them. Okay, and they're never going to be um, have the tools to be the responsible parties, even though they will be the responsible parties. You know, like uh, don't take pics with your cell phone and put them on Facebook, all right? And don't reply to somebody on Facebook about their condition or you know, blah 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 blah. You have to do more rigorous training in the environment that we are now in, and obviously your executive team is going to be on the hook, and they ought to be part of. Um, the governments, the governance structure, and if you don't get them on board, you're gonna, like we talked about earlier, have a difficult time. So, at this point, I'm gonna do a, a shameless plug for what we tried to uh, have accomplished today. We've tried to distill the essence of a HIPAA risk management program into something you can execute on immediately, and that's the key takeaway. You need to start executing on this stuff. Stop studying the problem for six or seven months and having committee meetings and you know all that is going to do is lead to analysis paralysis you're not going to get anything done and hopefully this training has provided a bit of a remote a roadmap you can use for launching your risk management program our products that we sell on the HIPAA survival guide store we have our subscription plan includes all our products every single product that you see out there are training products or security rule checklists or cloud checklists or privacy rule checklists you get all of them for $7.95 the first year. The second year is optional, and it's $4.95. Okay? And what do you get with the subscription? You get any new products, any updates of products. These recordings we're going to be making available on our uh, subscription site, and we're going to be doing other uh, project plans and things like that that we only make available to our subscribers. All our products have live links to the statutes and regulations going back to the HIPAA survival guide uh, and they're really intended to be agile educational products so what we try to do is provide the recipe the step-by-step -step, the thing that's missing from the NIST documents and missing elsewhere so we try to provide the recipe and not just the ingredients that you need so we provide educational products and really it's big on education until until you or your annual your organization become more literate as to how the game has changed, you're not going to be able to make progress. So we try to give you products that help you execute today. Model privacy policy, model security rule policy, model cloud policies, uh, breach notification framework for templates, etc. Right? And we try to enforce, our checklist tries to enforce this policy plus processes plus, plus tracking mechanisms as a way of producing visible demonstrable evidence so our privacy rule checklist goes through every requirement of the of the privacy rule has a suggested policy has suggested processes that you should implement and has suggested ways that you should track that process same thing with the security rule it goes through every implementation specification every standard here's the policy here are the processes here's the tracking mechanism that you ought to implement so Here's our focus They're on agile compliance products. Except no substitute. And here's a place where we'd like to get some feedback because we're going to start in 2014 doing HIPAA full day jam sessions, plural. We're going to do more than one, rocking the rules. The first one we're going to do is going to be in March 2014. We haven't really settled on a specific date, but it'll probably be in the first two weeks of March in Tampa because that is home. And uh, the price tag will be $15.95, but you get the subscription included. So you get all of our products included as part of the $15.95. If you're already a subscriber, then for then you can attend the all-day jam session for $800. Bucks, okay, so it's both for subscribers. And here's the thing: we want to help you jumpstart. And these are going to be working sessions, so yes, there's going to be a lecture component, but these are going to be working sessions where we actually move the ball down the field and show you how you can make progress and show you how you can start creating visible, demonstrable evidence of compliance. So if you have any interest at all in Tampa or if you're from another city and you want to just shoot us an email and say, you know what, I'd love to have it in in, in my city and see how many you know uh, we get back we are going to be doing these uh, up and down the East Coast and we will do it elsewhere uh, if the demand is there so get stuff done is really going to be 
the motto for the jam session. Get stuff done. Let's get moving. Let's get starting on what we need to do. So that's the shameless plug. I'm going to throw it open for some more Q&A if we have it. If not, it's been my pleasure being with you. All right, Carlos, we have two questions. Mark. During the assess step, how okay. much focus should we put on written policies? Well, uh, you know, uh, yeah, fair amount, right? Because you, you, you because you're required to have policies and procedures as part of the as part of the uh, privacy rule and as part of the um, security rule, right? They require you to have policies and procedures. If you don't have a policy and procedure in place, uh, then that's a vulnerability. So I, I would say, yeah, I mean, that's an important one. That's an important one that an HIT consultant's not going to be able to help you with, right? And that's part of what we provide in our subscription is we provide you a model security uh, policy. We can we sell that individually, but without understanding the processes that underpin it and the tracking mechanisms, all you really have is a policy. And you know, and from our perspective, that's not enough. I mean, sometimes people that's just all they they want, right? They don't really understand that they need this. So all the requirements uh, of the security rule are actually vulnerabilities that you need to address. Those are kind of or organizational and vulnerabilities, right? It's not it's not a purely technical exercise. And that's why I think a lot of people that treat a risk assessment as a purely IT technical exercise are going to miss the boat and miss all these other things that they should have been looking at. And the final question of the day uh, do you have different programs for BAs versus covered entities? No, and the reason is that there is no there is no uh, there is no HIPAA light for uh, for covered entities and and I mean for business associates. You have to go through through the rules it means that you could go through and say we don't need to do this. But the the objective is you can use our model policies and procedures and all that for both. Okay, uh, some covered entities might use more, some business associates might use less, but you can't ignore any of it. And so, you know, it, it, have these policies in place is, is a good thing, even in the scenario where you're a lawyer or, you know, or CPA and you show up on site, you should still have your policies and procedures for the security rule and privacy rule. Why? Because it's required by the law. That's the best answer that I can give you, and there is no, I know, I, I, I don't mean to be facetious here, I, I, I know that the requirements differ, but the rules themselves don't differentiate between this type of BEA, this type of covered entity, except for the flexibility factors covered in the general rule of the security rule, right, where you can consider size of the organization, complexity, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There is no other, uh, hey, these guys can do this and you guys can do that. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. We got another question. Can the privacy officer, okay. security officer, and compliance officer be the same, or which responsibilities can be included under one FTE? No, they can, they can all be the same. There's no, there's nothing in the regulation that says your privacy officer has to be different than your security officer. They can be, they can be one and the same. That's all the questions we have. All right, guys. Well, it's been my pleasure being with you. Thanks for listening. See you next time.